good afternoon all or or good morning good evening based on which, which part of the world you jo you are joining us from uh, i am sandeepan director at the foundation for agrarian studies and on behalf of the foundation or fas i welcome you all to the third seminar of uh, young scholars online seminar series 2022 23 Let me begin by thanking you all for a consistent and enthusiastic participation. I also thank Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung South Asia for their continuous support in running this series. I can only hope that the enthusiasm will continue to grow uh, in the subsequent months and as we move on to cover a range of topics including agriculture production, agrarian and labor relations, rural economy, caste in rural India and the question of women's work. in the indian countryside the first seminar you would recall was presented by juhi chatterjee in the month of april followed by dr srishti yadav in may juhi presented on aspects of energy use in indian agriculture while srishti's paper tried to locate caste in the agrarian question in india today both the sessions were attended by more than 70 scholars from different institutes across the globe and was followed by a lively discussion the comments and feedback received i believe will go a long way in shaping the research of these scholars i sincerely hope that we young scholars are learning a lot from these seminars and the discussions and i'm certain that it is also helping to build a network of young scholars working on rural india i will take this moment to let you know that fas invites scholars and students particularly doctoral and postdoctoral researchers who are interested in the field of agrarian studies and different socio economic aspects of rural life in india to come and work on a large database based on primary data on rural india a number of research scholars have already developed their doctoral research based on this data uh, we currently have a database on various socio economic indicators from 27 villages across 12 states in india collected through this pro through our program titled project on agrarian relations in india i request interested scholars to write to us in this regard we are most fortunate that professor barbara harris white emeritus professor of development studies at the university of oxford is chairing all the seminars of this series her expertise and insightful comments have greatly enriched this seminar all the seminars in this series in very many ways i again thank you professor barbara for agreeing to chair this seminar series let me also introduce our speaker for the third seminar dr raya das she will be speaking on a few aspects of the development of capitalism in agriculture of west bengal this is part of her doctoral research based on surveys of agricultural households in three villages from different agroecological regions of of the state Raya recently submitted her PhD sub, uh, thesis at the Jawaharlal Nehru JNU or Jawaharlal Nehru University New Delhi. Currently she is a fellow of Agriculture Policy, Sustainability and Innovation uh, at the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations New Delhi. Raya has closely worked uh, with FAS on a recently concluded study of of public spending uh, on agriculture in the last decade. Dr Aprajita Bakshi associate professor at the RV University Bangalore and a long standing research collaborator at FAS will be the discussant for this seminar as a matter of fact FAS has recently published a book titled socio economic surveys in three villages in west bengal a study of agrarian relations edited by Dr Aprajita and Dr Tapas Singh Modak the overall coordinator for this seminar series so maybe i'll just take a moment and show you the book this was uh, recently published and uh, for this book all of us at fas uh, you know we were part of this book project and we conducted uh, two rounds of surveys in three villages of the state located in different agroecological uh, zones in the state the data has been instrumental in shaping many a phd thesis so in a way today's topic holds a special place for all of us at fas the book on bengal is fifth of the socio economic survey series that is regularly published by fas the uh, the four other books in this series deal with the rural economy of rajasthan andhra pradesh karnataka and the state of tripura 
we are currently preparing a volume on the lower kaveri delta in tamil nadu so i would invite scholars interested in the rural economy of these states to do have a look at these books now without further ado let me call upon uh, the chair uh, for the series professor barbara to initiate and moderate the proceedings in the interest of time i suggest that everybody all of you in the audience kindly key in your comments and questions in the zoom q and a box they will be taken up in the interactive session that will follow the presentation with these words uh, professor barbara the floor is yours thank you very much sandeepan it's a great pleasure to chair this series as you know um <clears throat> and particularly this morning or this afternoon with so many people in the audience who've been involved in village studies of agrarian transformation in india the book series and especially in west bengal um in a moment i'm going to ask raya to give her presentation but before i do um as chair the timekeeping at which i'm very bad is that raya will speak i think for around 30 minutes <clears throat> and aparajita will respond and then i will also respond as a kind of segue into questions and answers so we hope to have a quarter of an hour plus of questions your questions and answers at the end um but first the presentation the title is accumulation or survival two very dramatic different pathways of agrarian change in west bengal over to you ra yeah thank thank you professor bagra for the introduction and also sandeepan and yes for giving me the platform to present my research findings and ideas so i just i'll share my screen can you see it is visible right Yeah, as the title uh, suggests, like uh, the conditions of accumulation and survival, development of capitalism and agriculture of West Bengal. This is a paper I am developing from my PhD thesis, which I submitted uh, JNU under the supervision of Professor Deepak Mishra and Professor Ravi Shrivastava. So uh, this is broadly the outline of the uh, presentation. Uh, first, I will discuss about the concept of peasantry and capitalist development then i will elaborate on my research focus of the paper and then uh, why the state i have chosen and what is the historical development of the state in agricultural development uh, as the study is based on field survey i will elaborate on the survey design and also the methodology of you know class and caste dynamics uh, i have used to trace the production relation and the villages and finally the two points how the channels of surplus accumulation and also the survival of peasantry are functioning in the agrarian relation in the state so uh, peasantry as we know that they are the conceptualization of peasantry uh, is different across different theories for example in shalovian theory peasantry is conceptualized uh, as a like you know, homogeneous unit run by family farm these are the big corporates so in uh, marxist analysis is basically uh, the uh, the class relations and how it is shaping the agrarian transition is the uh, tool point of analysis in moral economy peasantry is more of a cultural concept where you know the uh, survival and also the uh, in the subsistence strategy how they are coping in the capitalist economy those are discussed so uh, broadly this uh, this study uh, is uh, based on the theory of agrarian question and trying to you know add some value to the you know based on my uh, field uh, analysis and um, if we look at the peasant uh, 
household they are not in a vacuum they are all like kind of at the end point of the uh, global value chain and also you know this is not a very this is not like a uh, two dimensional picture there are many layers to it so if we look at the peasant household even even a rich peasant or whatever like we mentioned it at the class level they also have to they have aspirations they have they are connected to the different uh, markets and uh, also they are uh, uh, like recipro they reciprocate in their uh, in the market relations in different manner and they have different levels of you know the capacity to cope up the market uncertainty so why the state of west bengal the eastern state of bengal it, it has a long history in terms of like bengal famine to the foods uh, so food surplus or increasing food production uh, stage. Uh, so the state uh, kind of uh, crossed the impasse in 19, since the 1970, post 1977, actually after the institutional reform, there are many debates about the agricultural development of the state and the reasons behind it, like, you know, the similar time the uh, Green Revolution package came to the state. And also there was expansion of irrigation system. Uh, during that period and also there is institutional reform in terms of land reform and panchayat institutions taking place so so that was the period of uh, growth and after 1990s the data indicates there is a kind of stagnancy data in terms of both production and yield of yield of particular crops show kind of a uh, uh, stagnancy and also the problem i mean the challenge in west bengal is not always the productivity the productivity of particular paddies kind of comparable to the national average but the major problem i mean challenge is the uh, land population pressure so there is 7.13 million agriculture houses and they are largely marginalized 96 percentage of them are marginal and small farmers so if we see the kind of you know the uh, statuses from NSS 2018 19 round, the average income of the state from cultivation, the monthly income is rupees about 1000, which was like, you know, three times lower than the national average. So in broadly the political economy uh, literature, the kind of pre-capitalist uh, systems of, you know, in terms of like, you know, uh, bondage with landowners and also perpetual indebtedness were the main characteristics in India. West Bengal agriculture, where I argue here, this pre-capitalist relation is kind of compatible with capitalist development of the sector. Um, if we look at the with largely like look you know, at the cropping pattern of the state, the, there is kind of increase in high value crops, and particularly the potato cultivation has been increased, and the boro paddy, which was kind of uh, driver of agrarian agriculture growth after 1970s, it showed like a little bit of kind of decline in production uh, uh, and uh, stagnancy in production after the 1990s. So basically, Ralph, uh, major research focus of this paper is how the class differentiation affect the access to input and output market, how the tenural relations shape the mode of production debate, what are the kind of types of an extent of interlinkage in different markets, and finally, what are the constraints of agricultural development of the peasantry, and how the capitalism function in the state. So the study is based on three villages. So uh, the criteria of, so I'm not going in detail, but the criteria of choosing three villages from uh, uh, three districts were the first was the distinct cultivator population, second was the village size, uh, and the third is the village with at least 10% of SC population, scheduled caste population, as the state has a higher share of scheduled caste com uh, population compared to national average. So first round, there was census survey in all the villages based on a very primary questionnaire of cultivated land, land operated, the share proper or not, and the caste identity. Where the, the second round, the sample survey has been done. And you know, from the first round, the census survey, the, based on the land ownership, there has been uh, groups has been demarcated. And from the each group, a random sampling of 25% has been used for the uh, uh, major final sample. If we look at the village, three villages, I will just show you the location first. There are the three villages. 
So uh, the description wise, uh, this uh, Rupinathpur village is agriculturally advanced village, which is kind of, you know, like the uh, nearby the, uh, their town and the kind of with level connectivity in terms of uh, transport facilities. The village is also agriculturally advanced in terms of machinery uses and, you know, uh, and, uh, but the irrigation market is uh, privatized and uh, basically they are dependent on groundwater. I also, I just want to highlight that in Gopinath, there are also last number of Tepsigo contract farmers. So it's kind of an agriculturally advanced village in terms of technology and uh, the productivity as well. In Krishnapur, it's more of diverse agriculture. It's close to India-Bangladesh border. And to note that this region has faced like, you know, influx of migration. So basically the Nama Sundra population from 1971, they have a long history of joining the agricultural labor class who were distressed and landless. But in Krishnapur, the agriculture is very diversified in terms of like they have all the three paddy varieties, the jute cultivations, and also they have seasonal flower cultivation, which is an important livelihood strategy for the for, for the farms. Then on the other hand, Sharpa Lehana is on the red lateral region. So in this region, it is more of dry agriculture and agriculture is backward and also because of the lack of irrigation facilities only two crops are grown and also this region though this is nearby bolpur town you can see any kind of you know uh, developing in terms of you know use of uh, machineries and they are still dependent on bullock carts so it's kind of backward compared to other two villages so just to give you uh, for to some extent a caste composition of these three villages, all the three villages have like multi caste houses, but in Krishnapur it is a Dalit majority villages, whereas and also there is Muslim uh, households, but in uh, Gopinathpur is basically Hindu village and also they have diverse multi caste profile. In Sarpalehana the village has basically a high share of sharecroppers and the land owners are mostly absent landlords who are based on Bolpur or other towns. But they have the land ownership here and also they are the landowners. Uh, so the for the class differentiator uh, analysis, the, um, just quickly over through the method. Uh, so I have used land ownership, labor exploitation ratio, and land relation index. Land relation index is just land operated by land owned. So um, based on these three indicators and also qualitative indicators of socioeconomic history, engagement as renter and or trader, and also like a, a like you know uh, I mean the class of uh, uh, based on this like quantitative and qualitative indicators, some meta analysis has been done and the class, the agriculture population has been divided into these three class groups where rich farmers are kind of diverse in terms of their surplus accumulation. And also they have, uh, you know, differences in terms across villages, non-cultivate, both this category of houses, they do not directly participate in agricultural, uh, agriculture in terms of labor. But uh, the peasant households, they are at least one member of the household engaged in agriculture uh, for uh, labor, regularly for field work. But depending on the labor exploitation uh, ratio, they have been further divided into rich peasants, middle peasants, lower middle peasants, and poor peasants. And agriculture laborers are the pure agriculture laborers. These agri I mean, even in poor peasants and lower middle peasants, they are also. Uh, they can, uh, you know, wage out their labor, but these agricultural laborers, they neither lease in land or uh, they have they own any land. They are pure agricultural laborer class. If we look at the distribution uh, of the farm size and the class dynamics, we see that, of course, there is not the marginalization, the sub-marginalization of land in all the three villages. And also there is numerical preponderance of lower middle peasants and poor peasants across all villages. So now coming to the caste dynamics in class analysis. So they are just to show that there are like multiple, I mean, the caste profile is quite diverse in all these three villages. What I have done is there is one association I have, index I have used. Based on that, if you see that uh, the Brahmin population, the 46.15% rich farmers from are from Brahmin population. 
So why it is important to do the, uh, the intersectional analysis is that the two assumptions of dominant caste in agricultural development. One is related to the traditional hegemony on the resource and domain. And second is uh, technological adaptation and information dissemination. In Bengal context, actually, uh, basically there's Navaksha caste group, which are very prominent in Zamindari map. Historically, uh, if you look at the Sadhu community, they are the trader class who are general, who holds both the land and also the input dealer, input market, and yeah, an output market in the village. The present study uh, tried to do some assessment of intersectionality between class and caste to understand the class mobility among caste groups. The final finding is that it's not that the caste groups are homogeneous in terms of uh, like class position. We see class mobility even among the uh, lower schedule caste groups. So based on that, I have finalized four kinds of class groups. One is dominant caste. In case of Krishnapur village, there is preponderance, dominance of Malo caste group who are actually the Sri caste group, but they have the hegemony in the village and based on the Srinivasan's category of different dominant caste, which was further followed by Das Gupta. So there I use the concept of uh, numerical preponderance in terms of Krishnapur village, in terms of traditional dominance, and other two villages work like Gopinathpur and Sarpalena. So we see there is a kind of class mobility among the lower caste groups. So there is lower caste group with high class mobility, but there are other class like Uchi, Santhas, they are having least class mobility. So uh, and, uh, you see the in terms of inequality in land distribution, the agriculturally backward village has the highest land inequality. So from here, I would try to uh, like, you know, elaborate some story of accumulation and you know to show the inequality in the uh, uh, agrarian structure and also like uh, the kind of you know the uh, uh, survival and all the strategy peasants different sections of peasants uh, adopt for the uh, uh, for the livelihood so if we see the asset ownership also it, it is very skewed the lower class group with low class mobility has the least ownership of assets and uh, in terms of cropping pattern, if we see that farmers in the village, mostly in uh, Gopinathpur, grow almond, potato, and uh, uh, potato. But if you see there is in uh, Gopinathpur village, there is kind of trend of crop specialization among the rich farmers because they use uh, labor replacement technologies as well uh, of harvesters. And uh, whereas for middle peasants, they have the uh, tendency to lease in land even for potato cultivation, and uh, they are going for the you know, high risk value crops. Whereas in the Krishnapur Valley, uh, as I said, the agriculture is quite diversified. And um, if we look at the lease market, we see there is land hungryness among the peasantry. So at uh, there is now like you know the kind of in kind tenancy is not that you know it's a uh, process of any, any kind, particular process of any, any mode of production. Rather, the feature of tenancy is uh, the man interests who leases from whom. Conditions of tenure or contract which shapes the mode of production of the uh, region. From NSS also, like the uh, last 2012 data, it is the finding that the fixed rent tenancy is increasing in the state. And uh, the uh, field results also uh, indicate uh, on similar line. We see in all the uh, villages, other than Sarpalehana, fixed rent contract is a major mode of transaction. Where uh, in Sarpalehana, the share cropping comprises the large, uh, like you know, sharing of tenure transaction. In case of uh, Gopinathpur village, there is also a uh, reverse tenancy, 18 percentage of rich peasant household leasing land in Gopinathpur village to expand their production. So uh, Marx argued that the transformation from pre-capitalist rent to capitalist ground rent would be by emergence of capitalist tenant from tenants. So who pays the rent from surplus value, but here we mostly see a large section of petty tenants who leave land 
to you know to uh, they face a market volatility volatility but they lease in land for their uh, to i mean uh, for sustainability so even you know during the uh, potato you know, that's the kind of uh, story for all the three villages the krishnapur have village has the least uh, extent of tenancy in gopinathpur village even though the uh, rent is high like it is 44000 about 44000 per hectare for potato but and when they face the market glut and like in my area like year of survey the potato was sold at 2 rupees they had to face a tremendous loss so uh, on the other hand the person who is leasing out land like for rich farmers they are not facing the market and also they are getting the rent you know because of they own the land so that's the way the process functions in terms of labor it's an of course integral part of agrarian relations there are different labor contracts in the village uh, so in gopinathpur village there are seasonal labor there are migrant labor from purulia region which is comparatively backward as uh, district in bengal there are piece rate category there is emergence of you know like casualization of labor force and piece rate work in that way the land owner did not to supervise the operation and there are also daily wage laborer generally the uh, between daily wage wage laborer also there are paling who are like the whole time whole day laborer and also there are so there are roach there which is like whole, whole day and paling which is like for four hours work in paling work is mostly the potato uh, potato collections and those paling work is mostly taken by women who have to also manage household chores and manage kids so casualization of labor is uh, also visible in krishnapur uh, village but in sarpalana village there is more credit labor interlinkage we see that in uh, case of uh, agricultural laborer 42% of them were engaged uh, like you know uh, in credit labor uh, interlinkage with the land owner where wages received were was lower than the market rate so and uh, even in agriculturally advanced village there is attached labor where but of course the share is was very less but there were cases where you know the maybe the, they took the like you know they bought a plot from uh, somebody from the land owner family uh, but they have to prepay the amount of it by paying uh, by uh, wage you know in input market the two most important means of production is one irrigation farms and machinery so other than krishnapur village in krishnapur it is public irrigation system so we like i should let us the cost of cultivation is also low in krishnapur village but in gopinathpur particularly the renting out machinery is one of the major uh, like the way the you know the farmers of the yeah, I mean, rich farmers get uh, rental income uh, so if you see that uh, the technological change of the revolution period was not social neutral and depends on the control of means of production adaptation of machinery has reduced the time of cultivation and of course it has replaced the animal labor to most in extent in gopinathpur village to some extent still there in sarpalehana but again the dynamics is in the same village the picture i showed in the first slide the same village they have the tractor operation as well but the poor peasants they, they in the share properties they can't even afford that rental um uh, yeah, rental money to you know uh, to rent that uh, machinery so uh, renting out machinery for example in gopinathpur village there are 20 households who are owning tractor inside and 80 percentage of the owner of the tractor are from dominant and intermediary caste groups and all, all of them belong to elite rich or the rich farmers and rich peasants by class group rich farmers and rich peasants own 78% and 12% of total tractors respectively and um, if you uh, see in terms of irrigation a uh, submersible pump uh, uh, market there is also like in borrow period there has been increase in price of water which is one of the reason of declining uh, area under boro paddy so in output market we see the kind of similar trend one is that lack of access to minimum support price we all know that in eastern states the 
you know access to minimum of support price is very low in though it is increased by 2% from 2012 to 19 from nss is 4.6% but the field data indicates that you know even though the other class groups like you know don't have a significant percentage uh, participation uh, into like you know to it or to procurement agencies 38% of rich farmers in gopinathpur village had access to procurement agencies so the kind of uh, paddy price they received at procurement center was 1700 per quintal so in that uh, kharif season 1819 but uh, the price you know uh, they got like the rich uh, the middle peasants lower middle peasants they got the average price was 15 and 14.50 uh, uh, respectively and uh, it reduced to 11 rupees for poor peasants in terms of potato the dynamics of selling time is also reflects uh, the class and effects on the dynamics of you know selling time uh, in pre harvest price the in pre harvest season the price of potato is the maximum and that's uh, the harvest period uh, it is the lowest it crashed to 1.80 rupees and that's the time the major share of poor peasants sold their potato because mostly they are engaged with the uh, like you know they place their crop because the input cost is very high and because of the lack of affordability and also uh, cycle of indebtedness they uh, don't sell it to they they don't have the freedom to you know wait till the time the price gets high whereas rich peasants uh, they wait for the you know uh, for the post harvest or the pre harvest period when the price is the maximum so uh, in terms of income altogether income from farming and uh, class dynamics we see that across villages also there are differences uh, in income but the income inequality is also the highest in the agricultural advanced village whereas in krishnapur village the income inequality is the lowest and um, if we include the imputed uh, in terms of uh, return from farming when fdi is calculated based, based on paid out cost which also includes transport storage cost and uh, uh, in terms of if we add the imputed family labor cost the income from farming is negative so the broad contrast we see that uh, you know the survival strategies of peasantry is that marginal section of peasantry are i you know by the lower middle peasants poor peasants and pure agricultural labor category, they are seasonally living in land to, uh, you know, for the livelihood. They're taking loan from multiple sources. For example, if they, even if they have access to institutional credit, they are repaying by borrowing from somebody else. And then again, they are going to the from one production cycle to the next. They're also Pusan, uh, uh, share rearing, uh, rearing of livestock functions in the region. and. Particularly from Krishnapur, there was in the last section of circular migrant, even to Malaysian farm industry. The seasonal migrants and also uh, uh, circular migrants across all villages from different parts of India and abroad. And, uh, and remittances income, I'll show you next slide, it's in this uh, share of income. And um, they also participate in interlinked contracts for surviving in the capitalist agriculture so and the channels of accumulation is mainly by expanding non-farm business like garment business cement business and also there is investment in farm equipments as well and uh, also in the, as i discussed that there is living in land to expand production and one other thing i want to highlight there is kind of distinct investment in human capital you know i mean in my uh, qualitative interviews, I have heard a lot that, you know, they don't want their son to be farmer. So they invest in education, even particularly for private tutors, uh, 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 even uh, for middle prison houses. And uh, when you enter in contract, uh, the rich farmers and rich peasants are controlling, they take the, you know, the difference of price. They uh, uh, like they uh, the other section loss get uh, lost from the uh, you know exchange relation. So that is also the medium for surplus appropriation and also renting out from farm asset. So if we see the consumption expenditure where the poor this is a summed up picture of all villages. So if we see for poor peasants and lower middle peasants, the daily need comprises the largest share, whereas 
in uh, for rich farmers. It is uh, also the uh, educational investment and uh, the other in, uh, other uh, consumption expenditure has a uh, distinct share. Uh, whereas for the kind of annual income, we see that you know for casual wage income is a distinct share. So it's like a diversification for the lower sections of peasant classes. Whereas you see a uh, for uh, rich farmers, farm income is comprises not even fifty percent of their share, salary income, and also non-farm business a distinct share. So, particularly salary income, I don't think is a part. I mean, is a trade. It can be trade across class because when we're demarcating, like you know, doing the class exercise is most of a more of a relational study, a relational study rather than kind of you know deeper, uh, demarcating homogeneous group. So you see that. Uh, the maybe one one member of the poor peasant household are civic police. So like salary income, I see uh, from my field experience, there is kind of like, you know, I mean, visibility among, even among the lower sections of peasantry. So summing it up at the national level, accumulation of capital is entirely not dependent on surplus generation because there are other multinational companies for many sources, however, at village level, the power relations power relations still works, and also the agrarian question of capital remains. Uh, so, I think I will am over time. So I I'll end here and maybe looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Right. Well, time, um, Professor Bummer. You're you're not very much over time. Oh, but, sorry. Maybe uh, no, maybe okay. Maybe much. I can discuss this time. But but without further ado, I would like to call on Aparajita to give her discussant's comments. Over to you. Uh, first of all, Raya, let me congratulate you that it's uh, quite a comprehensive study and uh, you have covered much ground in your research. Uh, Having said that, I am in the role of a discussant, so I have to discuss. And uh, uh, I will first, you know, let me get some clarificatory questions out of the way, uh, out of my own personal curiosity, many of them. Uh, first of all, you know, how did you identify the agricultural households? Because when you did your sampling, I saw that you have uh, agricultural households. So how did you identify and what is the definition that you used? Uh, another thing that you skipped, or maybe I missed that, uh, when were the surveys con conducted? What were the year of the survey? And what was your uh, reference period? Was it an agricultural year? That also some clarification. Um, then in, uh, in your class relations, uh, in your, in your, when you uh, identification of classes, you have used this term land relations, which is a uh, you know, dichotomous variable zero one. Just I, I couldn't understand what it was, uh, and then you know some. Uh, just a little bit of interest because you know whenever we do village studies, uh, I'm also interested in uh, some of the village history, and uh, in the context of West Bengal, the history of land reform. Uh, what kind of uh, tenurial arrangements were there earlier? Sometimes become. Uh, quite uh, important. Uh, for example, when you were discussing uh, Sharpalehana, you mentioned that, you know, it is a village in contrast to the other two villages, you had a larger share of share crops. Huh. So, and, you know, I'm very close to that region. I, I hail from that region. So uh, I feel it has something to do with the uh, the Borgadari and, uh, you know, because most of the villages in that region, you know, uh, they, the land is owned by a few big zamindars, either Shuduler Zamindar or you know, some zamindars. Yeah, so uh, how much, you know, these sharecroppers were the old style Borgadars and was it, is it that that is keeping them uh, tied to the sharecropping arrangement? So, you know, some, a little bit, uh, of uh, that, you know, if, if I can understand the history a bit, probably the village will come alive a little bit more to me. Uh, and also looking forward, you know, the you mentioned in the passing that Gopinathpur has contract farming. Uh, but again, you know, when you're talking about uh, the capital accumulation, you talked 
quite at length about the potato cultivation and uh, what is happening there. Uh, what is the role of contract farming? Is it just a couple of farmers doing it and hence it does not have much of a uh, role to play in this whole picture of accumulation and how the farmers are uh, kind of navigating through the whole scene or it's more widespread. So uh, the, this is something that is that uh, again, you know, I would like to hear more. And also, you know, to begin with, to get a clearer picture, if I could have a simple table showing the class composition, you know, just in the villages, uh, different classes, what is the percentage share in the households? So, you know, I'm sorry, that is the way my I am wired and that is the way step by step I'm going through it. Maybe, so these are just clarificatory questions. Uh, now, uh, you know, this, you know, having worked on the book for quite a few years, I feel that uh, this, the question of capitalism and capitalist accumulation in agriculture and agrarian class formation, this is a very complex question in the context of West Bengal. And as you have rightly identified that, you know, it has uh, one of the smallest size of land holdings in the country, in, in, the, in India and that really, that small scale really complicates the picture. Also, something that is slightly missing, it came at the end of your presentation, but uh, uh, I didn't find it in the beginning is, you know, West Bengal also has a very high share of rural non-farm sector, both in terms of income and employment. So, that also this pluriactivity and this share of non-farm sector also poses uh, specific challenges or you know it, it brings about certain characteristics in the uh, process of accumulation as well as the nature and characterization of classes uh, so these two features you know i found during my research were uh, you know, in every aspect of uh, of the economic uh, uh, things that we studied, socioeconomic uh, uh, fields that we studied, uh, these two features were, you know, everywhere. Uh, these kind of uh, made a mark. Uh, so, why I'm saying that understanding that this has very uh, small land holdings is important. Because you know, in in FAS we have also studied other uh, other uh, areas in India, other villages in different states of India, and uh, when we compare West Bengal to these uh, other villages, and particularly when we compare the what you call the rich farmers or the capitalist farmers uh, in West West Bengal, the topmost class, the, the topmost class, they operate at a much lower scale. You know, they own fewer means of production, have probably have less power or influence over the village markets. So, you know, this kind of distinction that makes it unique. So, you know, this is the kind of economy that we are studying that that kind of needs to be emphasized, understood and uh, appreciated. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean because they operate at a smaller scale, that doesn't mean that the upper classes do not accumulate as you have shown very well in your analysis that they do invest in irrigation, they invest in some high value crops, they invest in ch children's education, uh, and they also invest in non-agricultural businesses. Uh, but why I said that I, you know, uh, picture of class composition, a simple table on class composition uh, would be interesting to me is because in my experience, you know, the proportion of households that invest, uh, that are able to make these investments, where, you know, you show the investment strategy at the end of your slide, the proportion of households would not be very large. And particularly when, again, we compare it to other parts of India. Uh, similarly, the scale of investment would uh, 
uh, would not be too large. So, you know, something about the scale of investment, some comparison with the situation assessment data. For example, the situation assessment data shows that agricultural income and uh, income of agricultural households, it is one of the lowest in India. So that is where, you know, some kind of uh, comparison, contextualization uh, would be interesting to see. In, though I understand that your major focus is looking at the villages. Uh, secondly, you know, tenancy is very interesting. It's, it's an interesting aspect in West Bengal. And uh, since I have been studying, you know, since my PhD days in, uh, in 2005 and all, uh, and, and it has not changed, that seasonal fixed rent tenancy is very common. In particularly in potatoes, vegetable, boro. And as you showed, it is uh, not the rich farmers who are leasing in. It is actually the middle farmers who lease in and uh, make the investments. And potato is a very risky kind of crop. Uh, so why is it, you know, it's very often, I think you also mentioned that it is a kind of risk averse behavior from the side of landowners, uh, which they pass it, they want to pass on the high cost and uncertainties to the tenants. Uh, and uh, tenants, on the other hand, they mitigate part of the risk by over exploiting their own family labor because potatoes, vegetables, these are uh, labor intensive crops. Uh, two more minutes, please. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, you know, uh, why things are happening, uh, you know, some more, and, and once this contract farming comes in, uh, how are, you know, how is the potato market changing? Are smaller farmers also participating in that? Uh, that is also something that is uh, interesting to me. So in short, what I would like to see is, you know, I think for a large majority of households, it is about survival. If you could give me some, uh, you know, some kind of uh, numbers there. And uh, also how you have mentioned how pluriactivity and non-farm sector plays a very definitive uh, role. Uh, now, non, you know, own account non-farm enterprises is very high in. West Bengal, you mentioned about uh, circular migration, but also not the number of non-farm enterprises is one of the highest in West Bengal. So, uh, you know, that is also one channel of uh, non-farm uh, employment and income, even for the very small uh, households, uh, because we saw that all kinds of households fr from the rich farmer to the poorest peasant, they engage with the uh, uh, non-farm businesses. So uh, these are, you know, uh, some of my my observations from my own studies and uh, which kind of match with yours. But, uh, uh, you know, I would uh, be happy if you, if you can share some more stories and, you know, some more details, some more thoughts on this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aparajita. Um, I would uh, love to see questions in the chat. Sometimes the chat is very full by this stage, but at present nobody has put questions in the chat. And while people are doing that, perhaps I could just add one or two more to the very um, rich set of questions which Aparajita has asked you. Um, firstly, uh, when you were describing the three villages, you described them um, in terms of a very large number of criteria that might have influenced their selection. And I began to think that the more criteria you use or you need to include in a study, the more villages you need. So um, did you have one criteria which was much more important, which led you to the choice of three villages? Because even three villages is quite ambitious, as Aparajita has said, especially for a doctoral project. Um, and I'd also like to ask you to consider whether a village is the right unit for the study of production and reproduction of classes 
under capitalist conditions, although you have said that you adhere to theories which um, suggest that uh, capitalism aggravates pre-capitalist agrarian relations, which is something that I don't think you came back to in the conclusion. Um, and I'd also like you to define a peasant because in your presentation, there's sort of unstable references to peasants, differentiated peasants, kisans and farmers and tenants and laborers, and, and of course, semi-feudal pro production relations, which appear at the start, refer to a paper that's 50 years old and don't appear anywhere else. And um, th there is an assumption that the peasantry is differentiated, and that assumption is made very clear in your careful classification of the agrarian societies that you studied. And yet at the end, and in the title, your models are of survival and of accumulation, and they are very starkly different. And the uh, contrast between the very nuanced classification of agrarian society and these two models, survival and accumulation, I think that they are in a tension. And I'd like you to reflect on that tension um, and particularly whether there are any processes in society which might um, militate against differentiation um, of your peasantry. I have many more questions, but we're going to run out of time, so I want to leave it there. Now, um, would you like to respond to those before we go to the chat, where I think there's one question? No, there's not one question. So yes, the next thing is for you to respond, Raya. Yeah, um, sure. Why don't you uh, respond to Aparajita first? Yeah, thanks for the inputs. Uh, maybe it was just a lack of time. I couldn't clarify all the points, especially uh, what uh, yeah, Professor Aparajita asked. So for, first of all, uh, the reference period was 2018-19 agriculture year for three villages. I uh, surveyed during 1920, but the reference period was 1819. Uh, agriculture and uh, for land relation index they asked it's not zero to one it is uh, land operated by land owned so there is uh, if there is no land uh, operated for example for agriculture labor class so then the value is infinity uh, zero so and if somebody is like you know we are leasing in 45 in uh, the land owner is, uh, the uh, area under land owned is higher than the land operated, then of course the value is less than one. In that way, the scale has been uh, used. So uh, thirdly, uh, the uh, history of tenure arrangement, as you have rightly pointed out, the Sarpalehana is of course under the Surul Zamindar, so the Bargalari system was operating and they are also, the, I have in my field also the, who are the registered Bargadar who are just like, you know, they were like in just the oral contracts is functioning. So that uh, difference is also there in all the villages. And uh, particularly in the Sarpalehana village, there is also an extension for the tribal extension of Santhas who are Bargadars for last, like for last three generations. So that's the uh, one of my uh, qualitative uh, thing which I couldn't show in this uh, survey that was the generational history of land like how you know the 15 somewhere like 15 big landowner family in uh, Topinapur village for example they somehow you know the land size has been declined they sold it off or you know uh, to like the small land owners so that's kind of the functioning uh, was there in all three villages coming to contract farming it's a very important section and uh, Actually, I'm, I have a paper on that, but this contract farming is not some, but few farmers are doing. It is quite distinct in Gopinathpur village, which, which uh, uh, they are like, you know, uh, there's two questions. Why the only the agriculturally advanced village has contract farming? Because Sarpalana village has also potato cultivation, but the company didn't go there. So that's the first point. And second, in terms of the class-wise participation in contract farming, you see the middle peasants are the higher participant in contract farming, but that doesn't mean they're only contract farmers. They're also cultivating the traditional Jyoti variety and they're diversifying the risk. Because in contract farming, you get the price fixed, 
like it was eight rupees in my uh, study uh, year is about per kg where they face like market glut for the jodi variety but there are problems associated in contract farming arrangement as well because you know the produce can't be sold to outside market because the atlanti variety is not it's sold in outside market even they can't themselves consume it so it's mostly diversification of risk by allotting some sections of your plot to contract farming and some to jyoti variety whereas the rich farmers we see that there is only specialization of the uh, like the traditional because they have the capacity to hold the produce for post harvest time uh, and another way the lower middle peasants and poor peasants have don't don't have the uh, like you know i participation in contract farming because firstly they don't get the contract in many cases for the low fragmented uh, land so uh, so that's the case of contract farming in terms of class composition i have a uh, this uh, dabar diagram where i have shown the uh, class distribution across three villages i can go back to that and uh, yeah and also again as you rightly said that non farm employment makes the case of bengal very particular and difficult and complex because a poor peasant in terms of production relation it can be poor peasant but one of the member of the household is like you know in that case income becomes a uh, important category like you know uh, uh, like category to demarcate plus the same time income is not the same across years so that brings the uh, the complexity but as you rightly said that in even in terms of non farm diversification we see like you know even poor peasants are giving a thela or something like that is the own account non farm activity is quite decent across the all class groups but the scale of it for example investing in like a big garment business or cement business and also farm uh, tractors so scale is, is varies across class groups and uh, coming to professor babar's uh, valuable input raya raya um there, there are now four questions in the chat and we will run out of time so why don't you leave what you think about my questions until after you've heard the other questions because they might interrelate is that all right i'm sorry to interrupt you but yeah. um what i'd like to do now is ask four questions um from the chat which are all following on from your own reflections after the presentation um bupendra is asking a question about caste and your reflections on caste are really nuanced you say there is but broad caste class mapping but you've also identified differentiation within a caste class differentiation and you've recorded the upward mobility of some dalits one dalit caste and bupendra's question is terribly interesting if the dominant ca caste is a low caste um and that dominant caste can hire in labor does that dominant caste a low caste ever hire in higher caste laborers and what would be the implications for long standing caste prejudice that's his question um and ranjini has a question which is quite related to that um which concerns um inter village variations in the caste control of overland if i haven't um paraphrased that badly and arinda wants you to tell us more about reverse tenancy which may well also relate to the caste class question and sithu has a question from the foundation has a question which i also had and forgot to or didn't have time to ask which is about the cost of production the cost of cultivation can you tell us more about inter village variation in the cost of cultivation and i would want to add class variations because you allege that there are class variations but you didn't give us the data okay so four questions over to you yeah <laughs> so uh just to i mean add uh, um on bupendra's point that particularly what my analysis was like you know particularly for one village where the uh, so called national caste who have a numerical preponderance and uh, they and also is not subjective the association indicates that 
the village, uh, like rich farmers and rich peasants have the higher association with these caste groups. So that makes the dominant caste and uh, for that village and for other two villages, traditional upper caste are only the dominant caste. Your question is that dominant caste uh, recruit or like take, I mean, uh, even if they are from lower caste, they are hiring uh, labor from upper caste or not. So in particular, I think the prejudices in, uh, is quite sharp because in a Brahmin household, even if uh, like, you know, there is kind of a notion that all Brahmin households, I mean, you know, maybe from upper caste and they have dominant, it's not the case because even they are poor, they don't touch the plow. So that is a kind of like, you know, very distinct quotation I got from many households. So, and even this presentation, I didn't go to the gender perspective. Even it yeah. reflects on the, you know, in the upper caste houses, even they, even if their income level is low, so then they don't go to the, our women don't go to the village. So these kind of prejudices, I haven't seen disappear. And also it varies across villages, uh, but uh, broadly it did uh, vanish. Uh, coming to the Ranjini's question about the, uh, land ownership that uh, so any particular reason yes there is because if for a guy in Krishnapur the Malu community they were actually previously their boatman now they became the agricultural caste when the influx of Namasudra population from Bangladesh came in they joined the lower agricultural labor class at that time they got the kind of upliftment and this village why I have chosen is because even in Bengal there is Hindu Muslim villages are quite they are they are like side by side, but they are distinct. But we see that there in Dalit preponderant village, there is also, there are also Muslim population. So though that's the reason that there's a diversity in India, you see in a Dalit dominant village. So there's of course an historicity in terms of caste composition at the beginning and also, but that reflects in the agrarian relation. And um, Coming to Setu's question, that cost of cultivation, yeah, of course, I like, of course, I didn't, uh, I just uh, uh, mentioned in a very uh, fast manner about irrigation cost, of course, to start with, in public irrigation system is available in Krishnapur village, there is RLI, deep tubal, so the irrigation cost is very low in uh, compared to other two villages. And on the other hand, in Gopinathpur village, the use of machinery and hiring of machinery is very high. So as Professor Barbara is also mentioning about the class dynamics, if you own the submersible pump, the cost of cultivation of like a price of water, though you have to give electricity bill, but you have the cost of cultivation reduces. So those are the factors which impacts on the cost of cultivation, which is rooted in the ownership of the means of production. And also please rent is one of the major component for example potato cultivation you have to give the lease rent and uh, again you have to face the market glass so that's why the cost of cultivation varies across class groups and um, that's it and uh, now i can i guess go back to professor barber's question of peasant defining uh, let me tell you the first thing is when we do it like you know the, in a classical like the class differential analysis of peasantry that and somehow, uh, like, uh, we forget that they, across the class groups also there is some homogeneity. So they are all facing market. But my point of analysis for this research was like the means of production and the ownership of means of production. So how much resource endowment they have, I mean, assuming or like in reality also, they are facing the market. So like, for example, as uh, Professor Apajita also said about the contract farming, when it came into the village, I was listening to the history of the contract farming, farmers behaved or reciprocated in a different manner depending on their economic capacity, on their strategy. So across class groups, my point is that the strategy doesn't, I mean, fade it if we have class differential analysis. So there can be similarity of strategy but uh, across between two class groups, especially among the marginal section of peasantry. So uh, based on the resource environment, this is the class analysis. And now how they are, you know, like, you know, what is the channels of accumulation? What are the, like, you know, surviving strategy that I have been there, that I have done in the another round of exercise to see like, you know, either overlapping or like how they are functioning. 
And uh, okay, why- can I butt in and just ask you whether any of them are petty commodity producers? And what, how you theorize peasantry in relation to petty commodity production? So the peasantry I mean, is participating in market. So when they are like, you know, part of both capital and they're also labor waging out, they are the petty commodity producer, right? I mean, I just can't believe that I'm having this petty commodity production conversation with you because your paper is the, like the mother paper for petty commodity production in Indian agriculture. So, uh, so, so that's, so that's the dynamics, right? So like peasant is, definition is by their direct producer. The definition of peasant that they are direct producer with the uh, system. And when they're participating in uh, market and also they're waiting out their petty commodity producer. Okay. So it's like this, even in the term farmer, like, you know, the farmer and peasant is like, I know the, all the towns are very, way and everything has like a history behind it how they have been conceptualized but for my analysis i can say yeah. the farmer peasant i have defined as the person who is directly uh, produced directly engaged to agriculture in terms of field work and other two classes i have kept as rich farmers and non-cultivator small-scale farmers so yeah thanks for the clarification Right, is there any, anything more you want to want to add? I would like to, I mean, I think there is one. So there's question. two questions in the chat. Are there two more in the chat? Sorry, I, I missed that. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. I guess I missed the last question or no. I mean, you have Shayam Sundar is asking about labor pooling. I think that can be quickly answered, whether it happens or not. And Shristi is asking about class relations. And I think, Shristi, that Rhea has answered that. So there's a very quick question for you, and then we'll wind up, about labour pooling strategies. A labor pooling strategies, like, for, for example, as I mentioned, there is one type is interlinkage. For example, like, you know, if you uh, if you uh, get my land for leasing, you will you have to work uh, for labor. So that's how the lease market is also competitive. And there is, oh, I haven't discussed here, but the, like the interlinkage process, there is also lease market and labor market interlinkage is there. And also for caste groups, when the peace rate working is uh, like work functioning is coming, they are like the, this called Chukti team, like, you know, the team of work or like 15, 20 people. So there the, uh, though my analysis, uh, this is out of scope of my analysis of social networking, but there the cast functions, but I can't like give you empirical data, my uh, validation for that. But when you form a team, so there the social cohesion and also uh, that uh, networking, of course, that reflects. Thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. We're not running out of questions. Um, thank you, um, Raya, and thank you, Aparajita, for very, very rich discussions of an incredibly complicated agrarian transition, which is West Bengal. And congratulations to foundation, the foundation for studying it in such depth. Um, I think I'll hand it back to Sandipan or Tapas to introduce the theme for the next um, seminar. But thank you all very much for participating. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'll take this, if you'll excuse me, I'll take this time to present a vote of thanks. Uh, part of it, I'll introduce the next speaker. Uh, uh, before, I would like to extend my thanks to Ms. Rayadas for her insightful presentation and Dr. Prakshita Bakshi for her participation and comments. We're especially grateful to Professor Barbara Harris White for chairing this session. I thank Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung South Asia for this continuous support in making this series possible. I thank all the attendees for participating and making this a lively session. We at the foundation sincerely hope that you will be able to participate in all the future sessions of the seminar series. I'm also thankful to the online team at FAS, Sandeepan, Tapas, Deepak, Setu and Rakesh for their role in conducting this program very smoothly. 
Before we end this session, I would also like to inform you about the next seminar, which will be held on the last Thursday, that is the 28th of July. Dr. Aritri Chakravarti will be presenting her work on the impact of information on technical efficiency of agricultural production in India. She is an assistant professor at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar School of Economics, University, Bangalore. We will be posting more details about the event on our website, that is fas.org.in and social media handles. You can find us at FAS Agri Studies on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I request that you follow the website and social media handles to not only get updates about the seminar series, as well as the work we do. A recording of the previous session that featured Dr. Srishti Yadav is available on YouTube. She spoke on cost diversification and the contemporary agrarian question in India from a field perspective. This session too will be made available on YouTube in the near future. We'll be ending this session with this. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and cooperation. Have a great evening.